You remember that bit in The Avengers where Iron Man fires his repulsors at Cap's shield so that Captain America can deflect it in a huge arc, killing a ton of alien weirdos? That is why we made this book, so your party can do new cool stuff like that. That was a super cool moment. We only see it in the final battle, but it's not something Iron Man can do, and it's not something Captain America can do. It's something they can only do together. Like the fastball special with Colossus and Wolverine. The rules in this book let you do stuff like that. It's one of the main reasons we made this book. So your party feels more like a team with new cool abilities you get because you work together. Hey everybody, Matt Colville here. The PDF for Kingdoms and Warfare is out. You can get it on our store, link in the doobly-doo, and this is the first of two videos where I explain what's in this book and how it works, because I think if I pitch it to you here, it'll make more sense when you read it. And I'm just incredibly proud of all the work we did, and I am dying to see what you think. On with the show. Your party has saved the town, or rescued the blacksmith's kids, or saved the beautiful dragon from the ravening princess, and you've got a base of operations. Maybe it's a ruined keep you took over. Maybe it's just the local tavern you hang out at. But you've saved some people, and now they look up to you as heroes, and some of them want to work for you, and now your party is an organization. You get some cool new abilities the entire party shares, and your organization can do stuff even while you're out adventuring. The only question is... What kind of organization do you want to be? Kingdoms and Warfare is a new book for 5th edition that lets players found an organization and lets the DM make the villain of the adventure the head of their own organization called an enemy realm. And our goal with this book was to make all this pretty simple. Like, the DM only needs to worry about one enemy realm and maybe a couple of NPC realms that might lend aid to one side or the other, but you don't need to track every organization in your game, just one PC org and one enemy realm. These are collectively called domains. Domains are simple. They have four skills and three defenses, like three different flavors of AC. But a domain doesn't have hit points. Uh, the only way you can defeat a domain is by defeating its leaders, probably in combat, which we call playing D&D. Like, any normal adventure has a bad guy, and that bad guy usually has lieutenants, and all we do is say, that is an organization. And just like the heroes get new cool abilities they can use in the final battle, so does the final boss of your adventure. In this video, I'm going to pitch organizations to you, and whether you're a player or a DM, I think you'll see it is easy to imagine which organization your party or the villain would be in charge of. And you should be able to just pick it up right now and start using it. There are orgs here in this book for any PC group and probably any bad guys you have in your campaign, but also we hope the stuff in here inspires you. We hope players read this book and say, okay, sure, yeah, we're an adventuring company, that's obvious, and there's a few different kinds of adventuring company we could be, but next time, let's all play an order of knights or monks, or a circle of wizards. That doesn't mean you all have to play wizards. No, of course not. A, a wizard's order needs a spy master and a master at arms and probably a priest. But if you choose to all be one class, each organization also comes with a few titles, which are unique special abilities that make it easier to play as all wizards and not die because you don't have a tank, for instance. Likewise, the DM can look at the list of enemy realms and say, okay, yeah, the villain in my campaign is obviously in charge of an undead kingdom, but then you read through the list and you start thinking, man, next time I, I want my villains to all be a coven of hags living in a swamp, raising an army of lizard folk to take over the local town. In other words, we designed this book to be easy and straightforward to use in your game right now, but also inspire your next game or your next character. There are a ton of ideas in here. Let's get started. This is a party sheet. You get one when you decide what kind of organization your party is. There are eight different kinds of player organizations in here, and each org has three specializations. So your group could certainly be an adventuring party. That's one of the catch-all organizations. But what kind of adventuring party? Are you a bunch of disorganized misfits? Are you an explorer's society? Maybe you're a mercenary company like the chain of Acheron. And already we get to one of the things I like about this book. You don't have to do what's obvious. You got lots of choices. The chain of Acheron could be a mercenary company adventuring party, but they could also reasonably be a martial regiment. The martial regiment is an organization for groups that have more traditional melee classes in them, but there are no class requirements for any organization. All that matters is what makes sense to you and what sounds cool. And the chain are certainly a kind of martial regiment. That makes total sense. Like all player orgs, the martial regiment has three specializations. Do any of them make sense for the chain? Well, one kind of martial regiment is a city watch. That makes sense. The chain are the city watch now in this one district of capital. The next specialization is a knightly order. 
That's plausible. All the officers in the chain now are Knights of Capital. But then you read what a knightly order gets, and they tend to be more about doing the right thing, which the chain is sort of 50-50 on. So maybe not that. The third flavor of martial regiment is a military squadron. Yeah, the chain could absolutely be a military squad. So you've got a lot of choices. Some orgs are broad, like the Adventuring Company or the Noble Court. You know, if your party saves the town or whatever and the king gives you a noble title and says, you're in charge of these people now, Baron Nicodemus. Well, it doesn't matter what the classes are in your party. You could absolutely be a noble court, and there are three flavors of noble court. And other organizations are more narrow, like the underworld syndicate or the religious order. Choosing an org is about what feels right, what's cool, what fits the theme of your party. Just like picking your character's class, there are no requirements for any of these. And you might think, oh, uh, the underworld syndicate, that sounds cool, spy network or a thieves guild, but we're not all thieves. Doesn't matter, a spy network needs wizards and priests and fighters. If it sounds cool and seems reasonable to your DM, go for it. Okay, eight different orgs, three specializations for each, but what can you do with an organization? Well, first of all, see this? This big empty space that says the power pool. When you found an organization, the PCs all become officers in that org, and each officer gets a power die. When your org is new and tiny, it starts off at a d4. In any battle after initiative is rolled, any or all of the officers can decide to roll their power die and add the result to the power pool by placing the die here on the party sheet where everyone can see it. If you roll a d4 and the result comes up three, then you place the die with the three facing up here on your party sheet. Now, you can do this anytime you roll initiative, but you only get your power die back after an extended rest, which is one week's rest and training back home. So you wanna save it for when it matters, which is probably the boss fight. That's why you only see Iron Man and Captain America use their cool arc beam shield attack in the final battle. Once you get some dice in the power pool, any officer can use them, and right under the power pool you have your organization powers. So if we assume the Chain of Acheron are a military regiment, the officers all get a new power called Brute Force. When a creature you can see within 60 feet of you moves, you can use your reaction to take any number of power dice from your domain's pool and make one weapon attack against the creature. Add the total of the power dice to the attack roll and the damage roll if the attack hits. That is a pretty straightforward ability. Somebody moves, I attack, and I get a bonus to the attack and damage. But it's a little cooler than that because any of us can use our reaction to do this, which means all of us could use our reactions to do this, and that is pretty crazy. We all get a free attack with a bonus? Well, maybe. Because this is where the fact that you are a team comes in. If more than one of us wants to use our reaction and anyone who does so can take any number of dice out of the pool, well, then we need to talk. We need to agree and plan. Who is gonna take which dice? Once a die is in the pool, it belongs to everyone. Well, actually, you don't, you don't have to agree. Whoever takes their reaction first could just grab all the dice. And that's also being part of a team. Sometimes you don't agree, but now you have something really interesting to talk about. What kind of band are you? Are you Rush and you all get along for 50 years, or are you the Eagles and you just fight all the time? Okay, so that's one power, the one you get from your org. Remember, each organization has three specializations. Let's imagine the chain chooses the Military Squadron specialization. Then they also get a second power, in this case, Skirmisher. As a bonus action, take a power die from your domain's pool. Your speed increases by a number of feet equal to five times the number on the die. Very useful if your party has a lot of melee fighters in it. This movement doesn't provoke opportunity attacks, and you gain a bonus to weapon damage equal to the number on the power die. At the end of each of your turns, decrement the power die. I love this, because this is both cool, I get a lot of bonus movement and it doesn't provoke, but it lasts. If I take a four out of the pool, then I get 20 feet of bonus movement this round, and then I decrement my power die, which means reduce it by one. And next round, I get 15 feet of bonus movement, and so on. So you get two new powers every officer in your org can use. One lets you take any or all of the dice from the pool as a reaction. The other lets you take only one die out of the pool as a bonus action. And we try to make sure that both powers don't use the same kind of action so they don't compete with each other. With these two powers, your band of soldiers and guards and brawlers are going to feel like a military unit. You can move like a unit, attack like a unit. 
Very cool, I genuinely love this. Now, all that might sound crazy powerful, but remember, you're only gonna get to do this on average like once per adventure. Each officer only gets one power die and it doesn't recharge until you go back and spend a week at home. And it's only a D4 when you start out. So it's a very limited resource. But you also look forward to defeating the enemy realm at the end of this adventure because that levels up your org and your power die gets bigger. And the enemy realms also get two new powers that the bad guy and their lieutenants could all use. But enemy realms sort of come pre-customized to make things easier for the DM. So instead of a few different enemy domains, each with several specializations, there are 16 enemy realms in here and they each get two different unique powers. Now, here's the thing. There's more cool stuff in this book, but you could just use the power die and the cool powers you get from being a team and ignore everything else in here. The power die and the power pool work fine all by themselves. And I'd love to tell you what all the powers in here do, but that would spoil the fun of you finding out for yourself. Hi thee hence to our store to pick up the PDF. I know that sounds like I'm trying to sell you something, which obviously I am, but I genuinely think that you will get a kick out of reading what all these powers can do. They are very cool. Your org does a lot more than just grant access to team powers. Your organization also has four skills and three different defenses, and your skills are useful just anytime you wanna do something that is more appropriate for your organization rather than for your character. Your domain skills are diplomacy, espionage, lore, and operations. And they are mostly self-explanatory. Diplomacy is useful when negotiating with other domains, and it's really useful if you can successfully treat with a potential ally, because they can lend you a warfare unit for the final battle of your adventure. Every domain, all the PC orgs, all the enemy realms, all come with a unique domain unit you can get if you manage to ally with them. But you could also use diplomacy for any kind of negotiation between domains. Maybe the local orcs are on the fence about helping the villain. Diplomacy might not get them to fight for you, but it might get them to sit this battle out so your enemy doesn't get those units. Maybe the local elves know something that would help you a lot. Well, try a diplomacy check. Maybe you can get them to tell you. Espionage lets you spy on other domains, which is obviously useful, especially if you want to know what kind of army your enemy is raising. But you can also use espionage to find out what other domains are planning, what side they'll be on in the upcoming battle, and maybe plant false information, getting them to turn on their evil ally and throw in with you. Anything you can think of that sounds like it would reasonably fall under the category of espionage, your domain can try, without your characters needing to do anything. Lore lets your organization research stuff without you having to do all the footwork, and the expectation here is that it's deep lore, ancient history, or arcane secrets. All the stuff you wish you had time to research, but you're busy being heroes, now your org can do. There's some overlap here with the sage background, but there are also a lot of unique actions your org can do that use the lore skill. Of course, a successful lore check might just mean you know where the answer is, but you've got to do some work for it. It's always up to the DM to decide how much adventuring you might have to do, but that's true of all these skills. A diplomacy test might mean you convince the elves to lend you the use of their elite archers for the coming battle, but those archers are pinned down by a black dragon right now. You wouldn't mind, would you? Thanks awfully so much. Finally, the operations skill lets you muster new warfare units or build fortifications, which can be very useful if the enemy realm is building an army. But it's also a catch-all category for anything your org might reasonably want to do that isn't covered by the other skills, like build new roads or send guards out to patrol your borders. And you can do all this stuff while you're adventuring. Your lieutenants and followers and retainers work for you and they know what you want or what you would do even while you are deep in a dungeon or battling atop a floating castle. Using your domain skills is useful even if you never use any of the stuff in the rest of this book. Can you sense a pattern here? But the main use of your domain skills is when two domains come into conflict. Conflict between two domains is called intrigue. Intrigue starts as soon as you or the enemy realm become aware of the other and start probing and testing each other in preparation for the final battle of the adventure. Like, whatever adventure you're in the middle of right now, you probably already know who the local bad guy is. It may be this is just the next villain and there's a larger villain at the end, that's fine. Those would be two different enemy realms, one working for the other. Just like initiative, the DM decides when intrigue starts. The players might do something to set it off, the villain might. And just like initiative, once intrigue starts, both sides start taking actions. Your domain gets a number of actions equal to four plus its size. So when you're just starting out, it's five actions. Both sides take actions at the same time and domain actions take a week to resolve. But it doesn't have to be a week. The DM decides how long the domain turns are and that can change over the course of the adventure. It might start off with each turn taking a week, but as you get closer to the final confrontation, it could be a day or after every combat. 
This lets the DM keep up the pace of the intrigue so it matches the pace of the adventure. Taking a domain action means picking a skill and deciding what you're going to do with it. Your domain might also get bonus domain actions or domain reactions that work the same way reactions and bonus actions work in the regular game. Some actions just require a skill test, like using operations to raise new units, but some actions, and here's where things get really cool, target the enemy realm. Remember when I said each domain has three defenses, like three different flavors of AC? Those defenses are communications, resolve, and resources. Communications is how quickly, securely, and accurately you can transmit information from the officers to your followers or between your followers. Resolve measures how committed your followers are to your cause. And resources is basically how rich are you? But not literally money, although it could measure that in the abstract. But not all domains need money the same way. Some value knowledge. It could just be how much food does your domain have? It could be anything your organization needs to do its thing. Each of these defenses has a numerical value that works just like AC. It's what you target with your actions. But, and this is the cool thing, each defense also has a level from minus three to plus three. At the beginning of the intrigue, all your defenses begin at normal, which is level zero. Same with the enemy realm. Comms normal, resolve normal, resources normal. As you take actions, you target each other's defenses with your skills and see if you can beat the enemy's defense value to lower their defense level. So your comms defense might be 15. That's pretty good. It's going to be hard for the enemy to mess with your communications. And your comms level is normal. Intrigue just started. The enemy decides to use their espionage skill as their first action to target your comms. If they equal or beat a 15, your comm defense stays the same, 15, but the level goes down. Normal comms become compromised. If it stays that way until the final battle, when you deploy your army, the enemy gets to pick one of your units and move it around a little, out of position. That's what compromised communications means. That unit got bad orders, and it wasn't where it was supposed to be when the battle started. Each defense has effects like this for all of its levels. Comms, for instance, goes from unbreakable to coded to secure, then normal, no effect, then compromised, garbled, and finally broken. And each of these does something different once the final battle starts. So you can target your enemy's defenses and try to lower them. Your enemy is trying to do the same thing to you. But you can also make a skill test to try to raise one of your defense levels. The enemy can do the same thing. Both of you, in other words, are using your actions to try to push the other side's defenses down while keeping yours up. And each domain, all the hero organizations, all the enemy realms, all get four unique actions they can perform during intrigue. So the Chain of Akron, our military squad, can use their skills to lower the enemy's defenses or raise their own, or they could use their unique armament domain action. Once per intrigue, they can make an operations test, and if they succeed, their resolve cannot go below zero for the rest of the intrigue. You know, we spent a week improving everyone's arms and armor, and so our organization is feeling really confident. But the chain can also use their actions to muster a special unit, the professionals, who are pretty awesome. All military regiments can do either of these, but the Chain of Akron are a military squadron, and they get two more unique actions. They have the war room where it happens, which lets them make an operations test against the enemy's comms. If they succeed, the enemy realm has disadvantage on any tests to increase their comms levels for the rest of the intrigue. That is pretty cool, and it means your organization is probably going to take some more actions to lower the enemy's communications, since they are going to have a hard time raising them again. That's basically it. The system is pretty straightforward. You can track everything on your party sheet, your skills, your defenses, what level they're each at, your powers, and your unique domain actions. And this shows you how to customize your domain with development points. So even two orgs with the same specialization will start with different stats. The rules aren't very long, but there are a ton of different domains in here. Eight hero orgs, each with three specializations, and then 16 unique enemy realms. That is the bulk of the first half of the book. We designed Intrigue to be fun. The testers had a blast with it. But at the end of every Intrigue is a final battle, probably the final battle of the adventure. Both sides raise an army, if they know what's good for them. And in the finale of the adventure, your officer PCs fight a combat with the enemy realms officers which was going to happen anyway, even if you never bought this book, while your army and their army fight a battle nearby. And in the next video, which should be in just a day or two, we'll talk about how warfare works. Then we might run some battles using the warfare system so that you have a real live example of it. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching, folks. If you made it all the way to the end, I think you have a pretty good idea how the domain rules in this book work, and I hope it sounds cool to you. The PDF is on our store right now. I have to thank all the designers who helped design the different domains in here. Celeste Conowich, uh, Gabe Hicks, Justice Armin, aka Co, Mackenzie de Armas, and Sam Manel. Teos Abadia wrote a really cool adventure for the book that teaches you how to use all this. And of course, James Intercasso, who did a lot of the design himself and managed the other designers. Thank God for James.
If you have any questions about any of this, I strongly encourage you to come by our Discord. We have a whole channel just for this book, and many of the testers are in there, as well as me and James, to answer folks' questions. Running the game will return. We just gotta make a couple of Kingdoms and Warfare videos first. Until next time, peace out.